Hello, welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari. This is the Great Big History Podcast. In today's episode, we do economics. Woo! And especially industrialization. So economics from 1500 to like 1715. Trade in 1300 was overland. From China and India to Europe. On what was the Silk Road. There are some... Uh, as the map will show you, there are some sea trade routes, but for the most part, there is not a lot of ocean-going navies, and so even the sea routes are relatively um, slow, and most trade happened through osmosis over land. You do not have Chinese merchants walking 6,000 miles to the Middle East. What they did is they walked to the next town, the next rest stop along the the Silk Road. They sold their goods, they bought goods, and they went back home. They went back to their, where they came from. And the new town, the guys who bought those goods, go a little further west to the next town. They sell goods. And so what you have is a series, not one giant highway that connects one place to the other. What you have is a series of rest stops, a day or two apart, that people go to and go back and forth between. And as they bought and sold goods, those goods moved from east to west. They took about 10 years to do so, and that's how that worked. Trade routes within the Middle East or within Africa connecting to Europe and the Middle East are a little more direct, a little less osmosis, but again, overland and relatively slow. In 1600, world trade is overwhelmingly by sea. New ships, new ocean-going ships, the dominance of Spain, Portugal, France, the Netherlands, and England, all thrust into the North Atlantic, allowed for ships and ocean travel. The discovery of the New World changed everything. It made ocean going, you had to have an ocean going ship now. You want to get back to America with all its sugar and all its gold and all its stuff, you now had to have ocean going vessels and they had to be better than what Columbus had. If you want to ship more goods, ships are going to have to get bigger. If you want to make sure you can survive hurricane season, they're going to have to get more stable. They're going to have to get more substantial. You're going to fight wars. 3,000 miles away from home, those ships are going to have to carry everything on it. They're going to have to carry soldiers on it, and they're going to have to have enough guns to protect themselves. And how much is enough guns? More. Whatever they have, add more. So by 1600, the overwhelming trade routes are waterborne. And those trade routes from India and China that went overland stopped. That meant those places like in Afghanistan in Tajikistan, in Kazakhstan, in Central Asia that had been rich for 2,000 years, Samarkand, Bukhara, Herat, Merv, become poor. And they become what you think of Afghanistan and Central Asia. When you think of Afghanistan and you think of Uzbekistan, you don't think of a rich place. You think of a place that time forgot. That's not true in 1000 AD. In 1000 AD, there's some of the richest, best educated places on earth, really only outdone by Abbasid Baghdad. It was a good place to live along the Silk Road. But the Silk Road shut down. A series of Mongolian wars and combined with waterborne trade ended it. So that today, Central Asia is one of the poorest places on earth because it's so cut off from major trade routes. So, interestingly, West China is trying to rebuild the Silk Road to connect between China to the Middle East to Africa, especially with energy. But it's a way of getting around. The idea is you go over land because... It's a way of getting around the U.S. Navy. That if the United States and China ever got into a war, China's in trouble. 
because the United States Navy is so much more powerful than anything China's got that it could shut down ocean-borne trade with China. And so, but if you have an overland route, the United States can't do anything about that. And so it's a way of connecting all of these places that had been connected to China. It is, it is a historical project. They had been connected to China. They had generated wealth with China along the way and to reconnect them and to replace European and North Atlantic trade routes that have dominated the globe for since the 1600s, for the last 500 years. The discovery of the new world plus gold equals you are going to America. New trades, sugar, slave, tobacco, cotton, so much more money. The discovery of the new world and gold meant you were going back to America. You couldn't not go back. The problem that Neil Armstrong had when he went to the moon was he didn't uncover a giant mountain of gold and platinum. Had he stepped onto the, onto the moon and went, oh, that's funny, and then brushed a little sand away and went, oh my God, it's made out of gold. You could bet Americans would have went back. New trades, sugar, slaves, tobacco, cotton, made so much money. All of this equaled you needed an economy of scale to make large profits. If you had one sugar farm of 10 acres, that did not help you. You can make a little bit of money. Great. But that's, it's not worth it because you're, you can't tie in to the much larger markets. You needed 500 acres, a thousand acres. You needed, you don't need one slave. You need 500 slaves. And that's what we call an economy of scale. You make money and by having a bigger investment, by simply making more of the thing. And so you need corporations because I don't have enough money to buy a thousand acres and 500 slaves. So what I do is I create a corporation big sugar corporation where I then sell percentages stock in my future profits. So you give me money now and I will give you a piece of the future profits later. That's basically how the stock market works. And so we get corporations and now the corporation is separate from me as the individual. Big Sugar is not Christopher Gennari. Christopher Gennari may be the CEO of Big Sugar, but Big Sugar is not, they are not synonymous. I am now a corporation, or my company is now a corporation, and I can get be gotten rid of if the investors, if there are enough of them, they outnumber me, don't like me running the show, they can get rid of me and put a new person in. So what this allowed was for groups of small investors to group their money together into a big sum. That big sum could then be invested into a larger corporation. That larger corporation creates bigger profits. These are the venture capitalists of the day. That's what they're searching for, the economy of scale. And what you get is banking, insurance, stock markets. We just talked about without even talking about a stock market that you needed now a place to to do this to sell future profits versus money today current investment versus future profits you need a place to get those two people together stock markets you needed infrastructure great i make the sugar how do i get it to to europe well i need a road from my house to the port i need a port that ships can dock at and that the port is big enough that large ships that can haul sugar can dock at it. We need roads and docks. We need education. We need all of those things that allow the, the company to do its job. 
that without it couldn't sell its goods. It couldn't bring the goods to market. It needs a place to sell them. It needs a place to manufacture them. This in turn creates a problem of wealth. Well, wait a minute. Why? Why is wealth a problem? Well, now I have money and I keep making more money. What do I do with it? I can put it under my mattress, but it doesn't do anything there. It just, and I keep making more money, which means I'm going to run out of room underneath my, my mattress. What do I do with my money? And so what I do is invent capitalism because what I do is I reinvest those profits. I say, here's the little bit I need to live on, but I make so much money. I'm going to take that. And I'm going to buy more land, more slaves. I'm going to build a um, molasses plant to turn the sugar into molasses so I could ship it, ship higher concentrations of sugar to the new world, to the new world, to Europe, make even more money. So, because remember, a liquid can hold more of a, of a substance than a solid. So molasses is sugar just in liquid form, and it has so much sugar in it, rather than just a powder, much less the cane, which takes up a lot of space. So I go from the cane, I grind it up to the sugar, and then I have to, I turn it into molasses, Maybe I go even the next step, turn it into rum. Ha ha ha. So I have to build a rum manufacturing plant. So, but each time I'm making more money. So factories and investment, and that's what capitalism is. Capitalism is private reinvestment. That a private individual owns the means of production. They own the factory. They own the farm. But they also take their profits and they reinvest them in that corporation. So capitalism, capitalism goes through several different stages. Capitalism is an economic system where private actors are allowed to own and control the use of property in accord with their own interests. This is why um, I am allowed to do with my land what I want. I buy 500 acres. They are my 500 acres. I want to farm them. I can farm them. I want to not farm them. I can not farm them. This is the field of dreams, right? He's, he turns a cornfield into a minor league bowl stadium. And people go, that's insane. He's like, well, it's my land. I can do what I want on it. Now, society will eventually create rules about what exactly you can do on it. But for the most part, you own your land. It's your land. So this is separate from the, so the economic control and the economic interests are separate from the control and interest of government. That's capitalism. Now capitalism, um, is, goes through several stages. We start with mercantilism. Now mercantilism is not capitalism, capitalism, is not mercantilism, but it's, it's, it's stages. Because capitalism is simply the system of private ownership. Well, mercantilism is too, except the state directs economic activity. The state, the government goes, and this is how the new world is. The king goes, Joe, Billy, Billy. Hi, I'm Billy. Billy, you are in charge of molasses production. And Billy owns molasses. Billy actually will pay. Hi, Mr. King. Uh, I want to be in charge of molasses production. I'm willing to pay you a million dollars right now. And the king says, Ooh, I could use a million dollars. I need to go fight some people. All right, Billy, you got molasses production. I want, I gave, you gave me a million dollars. You're in charge. I want 10% every year. Oh, of course, Mr. King. That's totally reasonable. Because this will keep someone from showing up and go, Oh, I like that deal. I'll offer you 2 million, Mr. King, next year. So, you know. You pay off the king. And this is from about 1300 to 1800. The state directs economic activity to its benefit, to the benefit of the king and the nobility. The king and the nobility are the largest actors. They're the largest regulators of the economy. Christopher Columbus goes to the New World. Why? Because he was given money 
men and ships by the Queen of Spain. He couldn't get it anywhere else. There were no banks saying, here, here's some ships. He couldn't set up a corporation. There was no one with the money to do so. He had to go to the king and the queen. And in Spain, the king didn't matter so much. It was the Queen Isabella who mattered. She was queen of Castile. She had the largest part of Spain. She matters. And so her decision matters. But that's what mercantilism is. It's the state. The state doesn't own economic activity necessarily, but it directs it. It's the largest actor and regulator in it. It's the largest investor because it has the most money. That will give way to laissez-faire. This is Adam Smith. That private individuals and corporations direct the economic activity through markets, separate from the control and direction of government. That laissez-faire is less government. The invisible hand of markets. I should decide what I want to buy and sell. And that goes from about 1750 to 1920. This idea. There is no laissez-faire anymore. It's this, 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 nobody. The business schools aren't going to teach it. It doesn't exist. You know, it's a dream because it comes with a lot of problems, a lot of inequality, a lot of destruction. Like laissez-faire says, I get to cart, uh, chop down this entire forest. Okay, well, and then I'm going to make lots of money from it. Laissez-faire is I get to own people as slaves because I have money and I can buy people. We don't live in that world. That world is gone. Private individuals and corporations direct the economic activity through markets. We still have markets and we still have private individuals and corporations, but they are not separate from the control or direction of government anymore. The idea of the, nobody lives in that world. And then we get the modern world, 1900 to now. So mercantilism is from roughly 1300 to 1800. Laissez-faire uh, capitalism is from 1750, maybe a little earlier, to, to 1920. Certainly 1929, it's over. Um, and then we have social welfare, where private individuals and corporations direct the economic activity through markets. So it looks like laissez-faire. It starts that way. While government regulates the policies and polices, I should say, government regulates and polices the marketplace by creating rules applicable to all actors in that marketplace. That's 1900 to now. The idea is that government regulates the marketplace for the larger benefit of the society. This is the Food and Drug Administration, right? There should be rules about what goes into food. Do you know what's in a frankfurter? No. Shouldn't you have some trust that what's in there is actually something that won't kill you? Drugs work the same way. That's why we have the FDA. That's the grade A meat. Right? This type of meat is, is good for humans to eat. We have regulations on how seatbelt works, on um, how airbags work, what can be put on television, at what time. NBC does not put hardcore pornography on at 2 in the afternoon. It could make money if it did. That would be laissez-faire capitalism. Hey, I can, I can make money doing this. I can make more money doing this than doing something else. So I'm going to do it. Well, the government and social welfare says, no, 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 no. No. We have rules over what you can put on the air. We don't want children watching this in the middle of the afternoon. No. You can make money. Put it on soap operas where sexy stuff is implied. Yeah, I can't actually show the sexy stuff. And NBC says, okay. So there are limits, whereas laissez-faire capitalism didn't have limits. Social welfare does. And that's essentially from 1900. The progressives looked at the destruction that the robber barons, that the Gilded Age was, was doing on people and societies and said, we have to regulate this. Government has to regulate the economy. 
And after 1929, this is the, this is essentially if you're a capital modern capitalist system, this is the system you've got. You have private individuals and corporations that use markets for economic activity, but those markets are regulated. You can only sell certain kinds of stock. The government allows you to only sell certain kinds of stock. So you can only do, you know, laissez-faire capitalism is I should be able to sell all the cocaine I want. We don't have that. So because we, we as a society have said selling lots of cocaine to people is bad for people, is bad for the social welfare. So that's the system we work in. All right, that brings us to industrialization, and that will be our next episode. Thank you.